ACL. And it did, it took a while to find Barbara. Barbara was not the first Barbara Paulson I spoke to, or the second. <laughs> she was actually the 19th <laughs> over many states. So I was very excited to finally find her. And the reason why I ended up finding Barbara Paulson in the first place actually has to do with my daughter. And so it started in the summer of 2010. My husband and I had just moved from California to Boston, and we're expecting our first child. And we were having a really difficult time coming up with baby names. We made these long lists of names, and nothing seemed right. And it was my husband who suggested the name Eleanor Francis. And when I first heard it, I wasn't sure. And so I did what parents do these days, and I Googled the name. And the first person to come up was a woman named Eleanor Francis Helene. And suddenly my computer was filled with this beautiful picture of her, taken in the 1960s, where she's accepting an award at NASA. And when I saw this picture, I was really stunned. Because I have a PhD in microbiology, I consider myself well-versed on the contributions of women to science and technology. And yet, I had realized I had never heard of the women that worked at NASA at this time. So I really wanted to learn more. And so I contacted the lab where Eleanor Francis worked, and that was the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California. Now, JPL is kind of a, an interesting place. It has an unusual history. Its founders were this very reckless group of young men that were known as the Suicide Squad. And they got this nickname because of the experiments they ran on the Caltech campus. So they sent up a fountain of nitrogen dioxide that ruined rocket science was still considered a fringe science. It wasn't something a serious scientist wanted to be involved in. But they soon got some recognition, and in 1939, they received the U.S. government's first grant for rocket research. And that $1,000 allowed them to work on a project called JADO, or Jet Assisted Takeoff. And basically, the idea behind this is they were strapping on rockets to the side of these light fixed wing aircraft. And their hope was that they could adapt this technology to one day power bombers over the Pacific. So this is still the early days of World War II. And they're a very small group at this point, but there is a woman from the very earliest days, and her name was Barbie Canwright. And she was hired as a computer. She and her husband, Richard Canwright, were the first computers of the lab. Now, before all of the digital devices we have today, a computer meant simply a person who computes. And laboratories would hire large numbers of computers to do all of the calculations for their experiments. Now, the group ended up having some success. And here's a picture of them. You can recognize Barbie kind of stands out as the only woman here in her skirt on the airfield. And with this success, they received more grants from the US government. And Richard Canwright was promoted to the position of engineer, but Barbie was not. And this was really how things were at the time. Most engineering schools were closed to women in this country. And so women were computers and men were engineers. So with her husband promoted, the lab now needed to hire more computers. So they hired two women and one man. And one of these women would be very important to the future of the laboratory. And her name was Macy Roberts. In 1942, she was made supervisor of the section of computers. And she decided that although she received applications from both men and women, she would only hire women. And her thinking was that if she hired a man, she worried they wouldn't listen to her simply because she was a woman. And Macy hired a lot of women. And Barbara can tell us a lot more about her. Well, Macy Roberts hired me in 1948. 
My two sisters were already working at JPL as uh, secretaries, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. We had been, uh, had just moved from Ohio about a year before that, um, and uh, so my one sister said, you know, there's a girl in my office that has this big calculator on her desk. It's bigger than a bread box and very, very heavy, and she does um, computations on it and writes them down. Of course, there were no printers then, and she often graphs them or plots them on graph paper, and she says, you know, it's something you should be able to do since you had all that math in high school. So I did go up and was interviewed, and she did hire me, and one of the reasons she hired me was because I was educated um, in the East, and she thought the schools were better there. So I started in September of 1948, and um, I, we were in this miserable building. Uh, it was the third building built on, uh, at JPL. And uh, it was cold in the, believe it or not, it gets chilly in California at times. But we had little heaters at our feet to keep us warm. Um, no air conditioning, of course. And we worked mostly for the two sections in that building. Uh, one was a um, fu um, liquid fuel section and the other was a design section and I did jobs for both. One was uh, computing trajectories with uh, just the path of the rocket, right? And those took all day, line by line. I computed with my calculator and writing down and so forth with my mechanical pencil. Um, and then the other, other one involved um, uh, test firings or motor, small motor firings which were done right across the street. They were called test pits and then afterwards, we would get the results of those tests, and we would do calculations and often graph on graph paper um, the data that they were looking for. And they were loud, oh my gosh, those tests were, didn't last very long, it was just maybe two or three seconds, but they were very, very loud. So they would sound a Ford horn, and it went something like this. Ooga. <laughs> that a couple times after you heard you knew what was coming, but the neighbors didn't know what was coming. <laughs> and that's where we got into trouble. <laughs> there was talk of them trying to get us moved before we got too big. And um, so we just thought of all sorts of places like Laguna Beach and Santa Barbara, wouldn't that be nice? I wouldn't mind me moving up there. But anyway, we. The, uh, I guess they uh, started uh, public relations at that point. <laughs> we're, it's still there in many, many more buildings. But um, anyway, that kept me busy for about 10 years just doing those calculations. And it was all for rockets. But later, ah, later that's when it got interesting. But you're going to have to say, you're going to say something about it. And you remember this place, of course, the lunch oh, room. Oh gosh, that's that <laughs> that little lunch counter. We'd we'd run over and get our sandwiches, and then when it rained, the, they would put the canvas curtains around so we wouldn't get <laughs> wet. And see that hill in back. See, we were up against the foothills, the San Gabriel foothills, um, just right above Pasadena and all the little towns east of Pasadena. So, um, yes, often we would see deer running around there, and just, that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these are the Frieden calculators yes. that Barbara and her team worked with, and they were these sort of large, clunky machines, wouldn't you say, Barbara? Uh, what, what, They're what, what, like what? kind of clunky machines, don't oh, you think? Yes, They're so loud. Noisy, very and noisy. Yeah. Yes, and, and remember we said later on there was a, a version of the freedom that would take square roots. Yeah. And we would, we would um, make a contest out or see who could do it the fastest because there was a lot of <laughs> going up and down rows. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And Barbara has some nice memories of this snowstorm, too, that occurred oh. at JPL. And there it is. Look at that, snow in California. 
that, um, as you see, their, their buildings were sparse. We're probably that building on the right-hand side. It's kind of an L-shaped building way down, sort of in the middle and to the right. But uh, that morning, um, when you approach JPL, if you're coming in from the west side, you go through a park called Oak Grove Park. And so that morning when I, I think I was driving by myself, drove up here with the cars back, way back, because the guard gate was, you had to go up a hill to the guard gate. Well, all those the cars were just stuck. And, <laughs> and one of our engineers actually had a, a ski rack on top of his car and ready to ski, if you know, at, at notice. So um, anyway, he skied into work that morning. And <laughs> It was just like a bunch of kids playing in the snow. Never, what's this stuff? You know? <laughs> but that was the only time. Yeah, yeah. Most of the that time, was there wasn't snow on the no, ground. No. You know, and this is an aerial view of what the lab looked like in 1959. So you can see it's growing a little bit at this point, but it's still a very small, neighborly kind of place to work at this time. And so Barbara and her colleagues are working on early missiles. They're working on corporal missiles. So this is a large 39-foot missile. They're also working on a sergeant. And these missiles actually never had a lot of use from a military perspective. But where they did become important was in space exploration. And we really see that in the 1950s when the team at JPL is working on designing the upper stages for a rocket called Jupiter-C. And to do this, the woman took their calculations from the Sargent missile, and they used a miniature version that they called baby sergeants, and they strapped together these baby sergeants and placed them in these large spinning tubs, one right on top of another. It's all placed on top of a large redstone rocket, and at its peak, there is a single baby sergeant whose aim is to launch the world's first satellite. And on September 20th, 1956, they fired Jupiter-C. And it is a very exciting launch because this rocket breaks all records for the time. It rises 3,335 miles into the air. It reaches Mach 18. Everyone is very excited. But at its peak, there is no satellite. Instead, it's actually weighed down by sandbags. And that's because the Eisenhower administration hadn't yet given JPL the go-ahead to launch a satellite. And so you can imagine the frustration when just a year later, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. And it's actually not until a second Sputnik is launched about a month later that the Eisenhower administration gives JPL the, the green light to go ahead with launching a satellite, and this is Explorer 1, and it is launched on January 31st, 1958. Now, there are very few people that can tell us what it was like in mission control during the launch of this history-making mission, uh, and one of them is Barbara Paulson. Mm -hmm. That was me. <laughs> um, I did get, the, I was asked to be there that night on January 31st, and um, I had wonderful company <laughs> there that night. Well, first of all, I'll tell you, I was there to plot points that, or data that was coming back from Cape Canaveral. And um, we had the, I, had the gra I, I had a light table there, because it was, for some reason, the, the room was dimmed. And I had my light table and graph paper and uh, my trusty mechanical pencil. And as the data came back, I would, plot these on uh, these point these data points and I even had French curves too to put the best line through it through the, the scattering of points but I had some very important people looking over my shoulder and I'll tell you and I don't know if you're familiar with them at all but one was the head of Caltech Caltech was almost in the middle of Pasadena it was uh, very much a part of Pasadena, and it actually uh, made up the policies for JPL. It, it told us when we had our, our holidays and so forth. But anyway, um, that night we had Dr. DeBridge, who was the head of JPL, uh, head of Caltech, 
We had Richard Feynman, who was a world-renowned uh, physicist, and he was a character. <laughs> and then we had Al Higgs, who became the spokesman for, for um, all the missions that followed. So I had them looking over my shoulder at, because they were so anxious for this to work, I mean, the, the reorbiter to be, at least go around once anyway. And um, so they were very interested in what I was plotting. The control room, when you look at them now, I think you had pictures. You don't have the, that night, yeah. but later on you had one, I think, yeah. what it looked like. But it was um, maybe uh, as wide as two of these panels, and there were four men sitting at these. It almost looked like a, a telephone, a person, um, telephone operators. Yeah. Switchboard operators. S switchboard yeah. operators. And then there were a few uh, men around watching what was coming back. But it was tense there before it once it, uh, the launch was fine. And then, of course, it went out of sight. It was behind, I mean, it was on the other side of the Earth. We didn't have deep space network that we have now. We have a network that goes, my goodness, there's one in Canberra. Uh, one in South Africa, one in Madrid, uh, Goldstone. Mm -hmm. But the, all they had was Cape Canaveral to say, okay, I'm here, I've made it my orbit, and I'm back again. So that first signal, oh my gosh, was there a lot of whooping and hollering. <laughs> You've seen it on tea sometimes when everybody's mm -hmm. hugging each other. And that's the, that's the, um, that was a night to remember, it really was. And it changed everything. After Explorer One, you know, the women would never work on weaponry again, focused on space exploration. We were so glad to be out of the rocket business and into the, the peaceful uh, space missions. Yeah. Made all the difference in the world. Yeah, and JPL went from being an army lab to now part of this new organization, NASA. Mm -hmm. So NASA was really born that night with Explorer right. One. And things were changing for Barbara, too, at that time. Oh, at this me. point, Macy Roberts retires, and Barbara is made the new supervisor. Um, but she is also getting to an age where she has met the love of her life, Perry, <laughs> and they are just getting married and ready to start a family. And at that point in time, so this is 1960, it was very unusual for uh, a woman to be a mother and work outside the home. So only about 20% of mothers worked outside of the home at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so Barbara can tell you more about her experience of balancing that and being in the lab. Yes, well, um, I should ask my daughters, how, how was it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can start, There's I guess, with, right? um, with pregnancy. Jake, yes, really yeah. Uh, Oh gosh, yes. I, I know. I know what you're getting at now. Um, <laughs> I was rather large. Let's see. I was expecting Karen on October the ninth, and um, it was. I was. Well, one thing I didn't say is the lab being in the foothills. Everything you're never on level ground. It seems like you're always going uphill or down. And um, so I was trudging up this. I remember parked my car and I was just trudging up the hill, and this guard said, oh, you should really get a, a parking place that's closer to where you work. Well, that was a mistake, because I was gone the next week. They learned that I was pregnant, and then my, uh, my section, uh, Dr. Gates, no, not the Dr. Gates then, that wasn't, um, anyway, uh, whoever was in charge, and Mrs. Robert, I could, um, no, she was gone. I was my own supervisor. Excuse me, I'm getting confused. <laughs> I was my, the su supervisor. But Dr. G uh, Gates, who was, um, was he involved at that time? I'm not sure. But anyway, it was reported that I was pregnant. And because of their insurance, the lab's insurance, uh, they just, I had to quit at the, right away. And I thought I was so important that I, you know, could work as long as I wanted to. And I found out the hard way. No. <laughs> well, luckily Barbara was able to come back, and she was able to do so thanks to a woman named Helen Lang, who you can see standing up in the second row. Helen Lang is a brilliant mathematician. She was hired in 1953 by Macy Roberts, 
and she was made supervisor of a section after Barbara left. And like Barbara, she was recently married, also starting a family. And she decided that she wanted to bring women back to the lab after they have had children. And she did so with this very complex system, this chart here, <laughs> that you may have a little trouble deciphering on the screen. Um, but essentially, after a woman left to have her children, she would call them and ask if they wanted to come back. And by doing this, they were able to form this very close-knit group and really depend on each other. Oh, yeah, we were a very close group. I, th that group of women were just so clever, so talented, and we just, Helen was a very good, uh, very good at hiring women. And um, she just seemed to have a knowledge of how they would fit into the group. And so we were a very close group, but I think it was Helen that drew this. It is a bar chart with our names on the left-hand side and then the years that we worked and so we could tell, if you can see the, the uh, breaks in the, some of the lines, mine about two-thirds of the way down. So I can tell exactly when I had Karen <laughs> and when I had Kathy. See, there's a break in the... Not that you would forget that. Not that I forget. <laughs> but she called me and said, um, I remember the second time she said, Judy's leaving, do you want to take her place? So that's how she would do it. She would call up because she knew these women and how what their worth ethics were like and and it would be so much easier even though technology had advanced it was so much easier to hire somebody that um, had worked with Helen and so we often saw somebody leave and then we'd see a couple years later we'd see them come back yeah and that was nice because we just became a really close group that enjoyed working with each other yeah and you'll note too that Helen's is a uh, bar is at the very top and it goes straight across with no breaks. Yes, she had, her parents would let us have her. So mm -hmm. she immediately had babysitters. Yeah. Yep. And because of uh, all of this close-knit group, uh, Barbara was able to have this beautiful family here with her husband, Harry and Karen and Kathy and still be part of this incredible group of women doing something very unusual at the lab and at the time. And this is actually all happening at a very pivotal moment in the history of technology. Because IBM computers, which have been at the lab for quite a while now, are just now in the 1960s gaining prominence at NASA. And what I found in my research was that at most other NASA centers, once IBM com computers came in, the women who worked as computers were fired. And this didn't happen at JPL. At the lab, it was actually the women who became the first computer programmers. They were the ones to write the earliest programs that sent our first spaceships to the moon and to the planets. And they did it with computers that looked like this. This is an IBM 1620 that the women affectionately named Cora. And Barbara can tell you more about what it was like to work with this machine. Well, these girls, that the girls in the, the picture just before this weren't the girls that I, well, a couple of them did go to work for Helen, but she hired other women. There's Helen right there in the second on the left. But uh, two, two or three from that group moved up into Helen's group uh, up in the mission design section. Yeah. And then she hired more women. But um, anyway, the first computer that we worked on and programmed on was the 1620. And we really enjoyed doing the 1620. It was right next door to our office. And we even gave it a name. Outside of our um, door were all our names listed. And at the very bottom was Cora Storage. And that was <laughs> part of the 1620. But it was fun because you, you, the engineer would bring the, the uh, job to you, the work to you, and you know, the equations and so forth, and then you would uh, set up your, we, oh, we had taken cl uh, classes in Fortran. And um, so we would write our programs, we would punch our cards, we would run it through, uh, there's the stack of them. And I took, I remember when I, uh, re retired, I took some home because they make wonderful lists. You could make lists on, on them. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. 
Um, but anyway, um, then of course that's Fortran. Now Fortran's pretty easy even to read. It's not hard to, you could read a, somebody could write a program and in Fortran and you could almost pick it up not knowing what it was all about. Do such and such for such and such long or, or else. <laughs> so, but the uh, machine did not uh, recognize that sort of language, so we would have to put it into another part of 1620 to convert it to the machine language and then uh, insert those into the uh, main part of the computer and that's when our, we got our answers out. Now, so much of the reason that the women became the first computer programmers is because the spirit of the lab was different. Even though it started as this army lab, you can tell just by the unusual group of founders, the suicide squad, that the atmosphere was always different there. And even today, it's quite different than other NASA centers. And even though it is certainly a progressive place, both then and now, women did still were subject to gender norms of the time. And one of the ones that I find most amusing were the beauty contests. So this is the misguided missile contest. <laughs> Barbara Paulson, the second runner up in 1955. Second runner up. <laughs> <laughs> she looks beautiful here in her polka dot dress. And the beauty contest was later renamed uh, the Queen of Outer Space. And so here you can see the director of the laboratory, Bill Pickering, crowning the winner of these contests. Um, and you know, as as silly as the contests are by today's standards, in a way they really do reflect the liberal hiring policies of JPL. No other NASA center could have held a beauty contest because they just didn't hire enough women. Um, but my, my favorite beauty contest story takes place in 1964 and it's during a mission called the Ranger 6. These were an early set of missions that were going to take the first close-up pictures of the lunar surface. And the idea was to make way for Apollo and to find a suitable landing spot. But it turns out that getting to the moon was quite difficult. And so by this point, 1964, there had already been five failed Ranger missions. And so you can imagine what the pressure was like at the lab for this mission. And people knew that their jobs were at stake. And not only that, but President Johnson was listening live to the feed of Ranger 6 as it approached the lunar surface. And so you can imagine what this is like. He's listening live to the feed. Everyone at JPL is holding their breath, hoping that this mission will be a success. And suddenly they hear a strange voice saying, spray on Avon and walk in fragrant beauty. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone just looks around thinking, what? Is this voice coming from the moon? What is happening? <laughs> and then they realize they have switched the feeds from Ranger 6 to the ongoing Queen of Outer Space contest that is happening <laughs> at JPL. And this is incredibly embarrassing moment for them. Um, but it's even more humiliating when they realize that Ranger 6 is also a failure. And it's not until Ranger 7 that we finally get those close-up pictures of the Sea of Tranquility. And so it's Ranger and Pioneer and these early lunar missions that then do make way for Apollo in 1969. And the women had a very important role leading up to this mission, and not just because of, of the earliest Ranger and the, and the surveyor missions that went to the moon, but also the rocket development that started uh, that led to the Saturn V rocket, and even the hypergolic propellant was developed in part thanks to the women's calculations at JPL. And those first words, one small step, was made possible because of the deep space network that these women spent a lot of time developing. Something else very momentous happens in 1969, and that is that the women are no longer computers. They are now engineers and assistant engineers, and this is a very big change. And it's also making way for a lot of changes happening at NASA. Uh, you can see that the lab is growing now. It's getting to be 
um, even more people coming in and the missions are also becoming very exciting at this point. And one of the ones that, uh, um, of the many missions that Barbara works on, one of the ones that is, is most exciting are the Voyagers. And these actually started in 1970 as part of a grand tour. And the idea here was that they wanted to get spacecraft out to the outer planets. And they had a very audacious scheme for how they would send these spaceships out to explore Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And it would take advantage of a once in 175 year alignment of the planets. But then in 1970, NASA faced severe budget cuts and with this, the grand tour was canceled. And it's thanks to a very small group of people at JPL who actually came in one weekend and devised a trajectory that would save this mission. And the idea here is that they would use something called gravity assist. So they would use the gravitational pull of the planets to build enough momentum for the spacecraft. So then the spacecraft would sort of be sent like a slingshot flinging from planet to planet and by this method, be able to reach the outer planets at a much lower cost because it wouldn't take as much propellant to get a spaceship all the way out there. And so you can see what that trajectory looks like for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And it is really thanks to this mission that we have so many beautiful images of our solar system. Um, here you can see Neptune and uh, the rings of Saturn, which of course have been false colored. So. Don't be alarmed there, they are looking very vibrant. And Jupiter and Uranus. And in fact, Voyager 1 is the first human made object to have entered interstellar space. So that mission continues today. Now Barbara also worked on a mission called Magellan. And this was launched on May 4th, 1989. It was the first spaceship to be launched through the space shuttle Atlantis and it was sent to explore Venus. And it's very fitting that Barbara would work on Magellan because she had also been there for the first mission to Venus and that was Mariner 2 that was launched in December 1962. And that mission was the first interplanetary spacecraft. So I'll let Barbara talk a little bit about Magellan. Oh, Magellan, okay. Uh, I worked uh, on Magellan in the uh, first in the um, development stage of Magellan. Worked for a man, um, Bob Wilson, a really nice person to work for. He was one that the lab uh, uh, regarded so highly that uh, they um, made arrangements for him to go home every weekend with his family in Salt Lake City. He would spend the week at near JPL living and then he'd go home every weekend and he had 10 children. And I said, oh, your wife must be an angel. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he was great to work for and uh, I worked on a program called OAT and that was um, Orbit Averaging Time Program. And I had a, a habit of really honing on my programs to make sure that they were efficiently written. <laughs> and so I remember Bob saying, Barbara, it is working just fine. Don't, do it. it's good, don't hone. So, and another thing was kind of, I remember um, after you changed, this was a part of a big program that, I mean big program, there were several teams working on it. This was a sequence. Uh, sequence, sequence design team and or program or mission and um, anyway after you made changes to this program that was already set up you made all kinds of tests and so we made sure that you did not upset any other part of the program well then you had to report to a group not necessarily the project manager but some someone in higher, much higher in the, in the ladder. And um, <laughs> Bob was there too with me. And uh, so I had to explain to these people what I did and that everything, I, the test proved that I didn't change anything that wasn't to be changed. 
But uh, he said, oh, he says, you better let Barbara go first. She's a nervous wreck. So <laughs> it was. I mean, you were up against these guys just hanging on every word, you know. You didn't make them. Because I'm sure that's happened. <laughs> but um, then I uh, switched from the operation. Then it got into the, um, of course, excuse me, the development. Then I worked with another team that actually were um, in operations. And there again, I worked for just a great group. Um, had I, was there anything else I was going to say about it? It was just, oh, when Magellan um, uh, mapped 95% of the planet, it was a very successful mission through the um, synthetic aperture radar. Can you explain to them what that is? <laughs> no. <laughs> Isn't there something bouncing off of something <laughs> and sending a big signal back and then they're able to tell the topography of the map? Sounds, Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Sounds really fast. But I, when I finished that program, I was given this beautiful picture. Oh, one of your centerpieces has it on, a small version of it, of the, of the picture of um, part of Venus. And um, I, I was given a very lovely tribute on the back of that picture and I have that in my den so I, it always reminds me of the Magellan days. Yeah, that's a great they were, Yeah. And another mission that you worked on was Galileo. So that was launched October 18th, 1989 and was sent to explore Jupiter. It was also the first spacecraft to explore uh, an asteroid so it passed by two asteroids on its way to Jupiter. And there was some tense moments with Galileo. I don't know if you want to talk about the antenna, about the umbrella features of the antenna. Yeah, I've had a picture of the spacecraft in the assembly building. But that was kind of fun to do. Uh, the spacecraft was assembled in one of our buildings, very, very, very tall building. And you could go up into the gallery section and watch the men working on the spacecraft. And then uh, what we saw at the top was this uh, umbrella-like antenna. It was called the high gain antenna. And um, anyway, that was very, the picture that I had shows it very plainly and, and how it's supposed to look after it opens up. Of course, it's closed like a closed <laughs> umbrella. But then once it gets to the, uh, the target or where you're, once you go into orbit, would that be once, or would it be ready? Yes, once yes, it came yeah. into orbit. It would, it would open up like it's shown there. Well, it didn't. There were three spokes that did not open up. And you know, one of the reasons is because three years, do you remember the uh, Challenger tragedy when the school teacher was, was killed? Um, that delayed Galileo and Magellan mission. And I just read about this the other day, that one of the reasons that those, not all of those spokes opened up is because they had dried out, that the, it had been three years, and um, they were just dry. Yeah. And that was terrible. <laughs> now, fortunately, the spacecraft was still able to get a, a lot of data from Saturn and its moons and was able to find some evidence for saltwater oceans on Europa. So it's still, still a very successful mission. And then it mission. plunged. It had it plunged. When yes, was that? Death that was plunge. 2000 when? It finally plunged oh. into the... Yes, that was... Um, hmm, I think wasn't it the beginning of the 2000s? No, it was no. earlier than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. We only case. have two planets that you can walk on, right? <laughs> 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 They're all gases. Did you know that? <laughs> I bet not everybody knew that. <laughs> no, Mars mm -hmm. and, and, and the Earth are separate. Anyway. Not a lot of walking on Mars yet, but certainly rovers exploring Mars. One of the missions that Barbara worked on towards the end of her career, a very long 42-year career at NASA JPL, was called Mars Observer. And this was a mission to Mars. And it was very exciting because it had been 17 years 
since NASA had sent a spacecraft to the red planet. So there were a lot of hopes for this mission. And Barbara can tell you more about what happened with it. Oh my goodness, well it, it was just a perfect mission until it was about to go into orbit around um, Mars. And then everything was quiet. There was no communication at all with, um, with uh, Mars rover, I mean Mars observer, that was the name of the mission. And um, when this happens, when something goes wrong, there's always a tiger team that comes together and tries to figure out. They have a prototype type of the um, spacecraft itself and with that and um, they try to figure out what went wrong. They can actually s s change software on the spacecraft and make adjustments and so many times they were able to rescue these missions but this time they didn't and I was, I remember where I was when this took place and when the announcement and I I just almost broke down. I mean, it was such a shock to have a perfect mission that just all of a sudden went awry. Yeah, yeah. so heartbreaking. Really is. You work on something long enough, you just, well, I, can, I can't imagine the engineers that, some of them build their whole careers on certain missions. And when they're, they don't work out, it must be a terrible, I know it is, terrible thing. Definitely thanks to Barbara and the team at JPL who were of course able to eventually land rovers at Mars. So there's been Sojourner and Spirit and Opportunity and most recently Curiosity that have given us all these great views of the red planet. And in 2013, I was fortunate enough to hold a reunion of the women who worked as computers at JPL. And this was a really special occasion, just to be back in the lab with Barbara and this group of women and hearing their memories firsthand and seeing the places that they worked uh, for so many decades, this whole group. I mean, it was really quite an experience. And I don't oh, know if you want to talk about it. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. Some of those women I haven't seen since, well, let's see, one of them worked in the early 50s and I hadn't seen her since then. And um, yeah, there were a few of them there. We got together, we, en we enjoyed each other so much and we liked each other so much that we would gather at Caltech. Most people were lived or not too far away. And we would uh, have um, lunch at, at their Athenaeum, a beautiful, beautiful dining room right there at Caltech. And um, I bet if I were back there now, we'd, you know, we'd be making plans to have lunch together because um, just enjoyed good company. <laughs> yeah, so it was a wonderful reunion, although for me, I was surprised to learn how much the lab had forgotten about the contributions of this group. And they had been left out of so many celebrations and anniversaries. In 2008, NASA held a big gala in honor of the 50th anniversary of Explorer 1, America's first satellite, but they didn't invite any of the women that were present in mission control that evening, not even Barbara Paulson, who was such an important part of that mission's success. Um, fortunately, we've now had the opportunity to spend many hours at JPL, so I'm confident that those mistakes won't be made in the future. But I wanted to write this book because I felt that this group of women were so deserving of recognition, and so their, their history is so rich and so exciting. Um, and I also feel that it's very inspirational for young people interested in science and technology today. And we have a lot to be inspired about at NASA. 2016 marks the first year that the NASA astronaut class is half women. And at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and here it is right here, um, the, there are more women employed at every level than any other NASA center. And it is really thanks to Barbara and this group of pioneers that made this possible. So this is my daughter with Barbara and Karen and Kathy. We did name her Eleanor Francis. 
And I, I'm just so thrilled that she has this incredible, inspirational woman to look up to in her life. And I feel so lucky to have met you. Oh, thank you. Well, you've changed my life, and these last three years have been so exciting. <laughs> really, I mean, I have people calling me for, to talk in front of book uh, for clubs and so forth. I just, it's been so much fun, and they're so interested in it. It's just like, I just feel, gosh, I, there's something I just want to, sh you know, people I can share this with. Um, to me, it was just, the, the day I was hired was the day I was blessed because uh, it just gave me a career over those 42 years that were just outstanding. And the, the people that you work with, the engineers, and it was, it will keep, that's why I'm, the age I am, I'm still going, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Nathalia has just been such a supporter of our group. And, and who would have known? I was told a couple times, gosh, you ought to write a book, all your stories. Well, who dreamed <laughs> that Nathalia came along? Bless her heart. <laughs> We're good mates. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we've really appreciated talking with you and we're happy to answer questions and sign books and anything at all. So thanks so much for having us. So uh, are there any questions from the audience for either Barbara or Nathalia at this time? We're happy to take a little Q&A time if you'd like. Hold on, I think we're all, okay, all right. All right, yeah. is there, okay, over here, yes. <laughs> Now that you ask, there was, this was after my children were grown, that uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, as you approached JPL's gate, you went through a park and they did um, put in a preschool um, place there. And I, I think maybe it's kindergarten too. But I thought, oh my gosh. I wish I had had that before. I could have just dropped my children off. And here we were, I mean, they were, uh, JPL's, um, well, you knew it was going to be the best um, since it was run by JPL. And that would have been just great. So that was, that was there, but that was not for me to take advantage of. There was just one engineer that had, and I, my boss said, now Mrs. Roberts said, you don't have to go in there. He can bring his work to you. But he had these girly pictures all over. <laughs> this was the early part of JPL, I know right now. that No, 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 no. But uh, no, uh, Lynn Wilson. Anybody know Lynn Wilson? <laughs> He's probably long gone. <laughs> but he, yes, he had a problem with having to have girly pictures. <laughs> but that was the only, that's the only, no, uh -uh, never, never did I throw anything. And always very respectful. And, you know, I didn't have the education that most of the other, not most, but many of the others did because, because that's when you got, later you got degrees in computer science. And we had many later on that had their degrees in that. Too, but um, what? So I have a question over here. I was your boss, Bob, and I know you were born in Texas. <laughs> oh, he was Mormon. 
and they had their first five children when he was he lived near the lab and they decided to move to Salt Lake City and um, they had five more <laughs> that's why I said he I said Bob you're <laughs> Your wife has got to be an angel. It just, but he would go home on weekends and then spend a, a time, really a um, good time with, maybe he'd pick one or two of them and go, they'd go fishing together. And um, yeah. But back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> Imagine the miles he accumulated. <laughs> I think they went to, oh, I know they went to Hawaii at least once or twice on the <laughs> creek. I hear, I, where are you? Oh, George, George, hi. No, no, there was a different, I got a job one time that I just looked at it. There's no way I can do this. It was a rather involved equations. And I thought about it all night long. <laughs> But anyway, I went to Helen and explained, and she was pretty good about filtering jobs. She knew who could do what in the group, and uh, that just happened one time. Charles Tang, I remember he wasn't too happy, but I just, I can't do it. So Helen did it. She was the greatest boss, the Chinese lady. It's funny, is it, oh, what are we, the time? It's close to two o'clock, I guess that's okay. She was, um, she was beloved by all the engineers. There was one engineer that only wanted her doing his work, and we were so relieved. <laughs> because he was, he was something else. Um, and he was very good. I mean, he grew, drove himself also, but um, we were happy that he settled on Helen. But, um, and you know, she was just remarkable. I was telling, I was telling uh, um, this lady over here, Nathalia, <laughs> that's my problem nowadays. Um, she would, um, she had a, usually had a separate office and she would have a stack of, a stack of IBM paper here printed, printed out from different jobs that she did and somebody like Bob Mitchell, who she worked for a lot, would come in to the, and say, well, Helen, do you remember that job you worked for me in? And do you think you could do blah, 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 blah? And she'd go down and she'd slip her finger out. <laughs> she just, and it was just great, so great to work for. I just looked all that. Um, but, and then, or she could, um, she kind of walked around just to see how everybody was doing. And I said, oh, gosh, Helen, there's something wrong right in that area. It's just not working out. And she, I can still see her now standing, just holding her cup there. And there it is, right there, every time. So she was, she was extraordinary. She's still living in, in a senior place in Pasadena. And I'd love to go back and see her because we were really close. I mean, I just like to go back and say, just hold her hand and say, thank you, Helen, you know. Did I answer it okay, George? <laughs> oh, the first 10 years, it, we were under Army contract. So it was confidential or secret. And everything had to go in the, the uh, file drawers, the steel files. Uh, when we were working for the army, and uh, boy, it certainly kept your desk clean, because every night, you know, <laughs> things wouldn't accumulate. Um, but uh, one night, about two o'clock, I got a call from a guard that said, uh, "You left the file drawer open, and it wasn't locked." And I thought, now should I call Mrs. Roberts? Oh no, not at her age. Gee, she was only fifty-five or something. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I didn't live that far away, so I went up and 
and locked it, but I, that never happened again. <laughs> There's another question back here. Yeah. Jody. Yeah. 